So I'm with Lord Richard Layard, Director of the Wellbeing Programme at the London School of Economics Centre for Economic Performance. Also founder of the fantastic charity Action for Happiness, which now has currently over 80,000 followers and has supporters in over 170 countries worldwide. My co-host Anne and I have been hosting the Action for Happiness podcast series uh, for a while now and we're truly honoured to be sat with its founder. Um, I found out about the Action for Happiness charity actually through Anne, who attended the eight-week Exploring What Matters course. Yeah, so uh, it was online. I stumbled upon this organisation just by mistake, really. I was on YouTube and uh, I was watching the TED Talk on Matthew, uh, Matthew Rickard's TED Talk. And then he was actually, uh, he did a TED talk for Action for Happiness. So that's how I came across this organisation. And the message, you know, the simple message, the simple pledge, I felt made so much sense to me that I was, couldn't wait to sort of share it with you. And, and right. yeah, so it was just very, by accident, sort of browsing online. It just shows the power of the internet. Right. It can be, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Richard, can you explain to our viewers, what is the Action for Happiness movement? And, and what inspired you to create it? Well, it's a movement for cultural change so that people can lead more fulfilling lives. Uh, and I suppose it starts from the sort of paradox uh, in our society that we've become so much richer than we were, say, 70 years ago, um, that we've actually not become happier. Uh, and that must be because there's something wrong in our objectives. And uh, we talk a lot about economic growth as the most important thing for a country, about uh, earning money is the most important thing for an individual. Um, but actually, aren't there more important uh, things as well? And uh, what uh, this brings us back to is the great original ideal of the 18th century Enlightenment, uh, which sort of took us out of the era of superstition to what is it we want from our lives. It is that we would like to have a, a society in which people are happy and flourishing and enjoying their lives. Um, and that should be the goal and how we judge our society. So that should be the, uh, the kind of objective of policymakers uh, to try and uh, allocate money, not to make the country richer, but to make it happier, which might involve, of course, some efforts to make it richer, but lots of other things as well, which may be more important for happiness in particular to support people in developing good relationships, which we know to be very important to develop good mental health yeah. uh, and so on. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a message to, to policymakers, but above all, it's a message to individuals. How should we be living our own lives? Yeah. We should be living our own lives to produce what we think is a good situation yes. in the world, which is as many people happy as possible. So the basic idea in Action for Happiness was that we would ask people to pledge to lead their lives to try and create as much happiness in the world as they could and as little misery uh, and that's the pledge that uh, some 70,000 people have now taken yeah. um, and, and obviously the issue is well how do we do that <laughs> uh, and um, it, it, it obviously requires a society which is more altruistic than the society today. It's not, we're not going to have a happy society if each person is just aiming at their own individual happiness. Mm. Uh, we're going to have a happy society if people are aiming at the, mainly at the happiness of other people, which we also know mm -hmm. to be a good way of becoming happy yourself, is to yeah. be uh, trying to make other people happy. So we're trying to reorient society away from preoccupation with self mm. towards uh, preoccupation with the well-being of, of others. But based on a, a, a proper valuation of our own inner state. Yes. Uh, and there I think uh, that our connection with the Eastern wisdom has been quite important. Yeah. Because we do have from uh, Buddhism in particular, which goes back of course to Hinduism, uh, we have some really good um, psychological disciplines that people can practice uh, for escaping from preoccupation with self um, to a more altruistic, um, uh, outward-looking uh, lifestyle, yes. uh, which is what would produce a better society for, for everybody. So that, that, that is one of the means 
which Action for Happiness stands for, but it's not a, it's not a Buddhist movement. <laughs> uh, it's not a movement for mindfulness, even, if that's the word that you like to describe sure. uh, that type of philosophy uh, as adapted in the West. But it, it's a movement towards um, uh, a, a fun-based ethical society, not a hair shirt mm -hmm. ethical yeah. uh, uh, style of living, but one in which the value is to make people enjoy enjoy their lives mm. I think it's important to, to stress that even if your your goals are sort of deeply self-centered that actually if you realize if you're doing good it makes makes you feel good for others then, exactly you know if, even yeah. if that's your motive. yes I mean the Dalai Lama always says that, you know when he does good uh, he gets more from it than other people I think that's that 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 could, could be an overstatement because sometimes actually it hurts to uh, do things that other people need to have done, and yeah. we need to be realistic about that. Yes. But but on on the we know you know the evidence shows that on on the long in the long long run mm. people who care more about other people also are happier themselves. Yeah. <clears throat> we want a movement um, which has been largely web based um, to become a face to face organisation. Mm. Um, initially right across Britain and then across the world. Uh, so we're looking to this to be, uh, you know, a year when suddenly within two or three years we've got thousands of these groups yeah. established. Uh, so that, you know, like if you're a Quaker, you know, there's a Quaker meeting somewhere. Yeah. If there's an action of happiness, if you want to, an action of happiness person, there's an action of happiness yeah. group wherever you are. Yeah. And that people can belong to a group and go to it regularly, and this can be um, a sort of pillar uh, supporting them in life. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I read in several places that you know you're you're responsible for getting members of parliament to meditate. Yeah. Uh, and recent, you know, with the the recent um, the Mindful Nation UK, yeah, they published yeah. the report. You know, inspired by you. Um, uh, report by the Mindfulness All Party Parliamentary Group, mm -hmm. where they, they kind of broke down the science and its application in schools, in the the prison system, in education. Um, what happened as a result of that? And perhaps you could tell us something. About well, that. I think that um, this this is the very first step. Mm -hmm. um, Groundbreaking, uh, and, yeah. And the the idea was was not to go over the top. Um, so. Um, in education, uh, there is a mindfulness in schools pilot, a re really important scientific pilot, six million pounds being spent by the Wellcome Foundation. Um, so, uh, to, to support uh, the rollout of that, we were advocating that the government should put up some money for um, which our schools could compete for their way in which they wanted to. Um, develop mindfulness in uh, a teaching in their school. Um, in the NHS, uh, mindfulness has always been a, a, a preventive treatment for depression mm -hmm. that's been recommended by NICE but has not been available, so pushing that, pushing that forward. Uh, as you mentioned, and uh, have it available for, for prisoners. Um, uh, so a lot of, a lot of actually small but very practical things that could be done um, and uh, you know being followed up actively at this moment <clears throat> and why is it now that there is such support for the for the movement for action for well i think the first thing is a, a disillusionment with economic growth and this is not since the crash this is before the, the crash um people wondering how, how can it be <laughs> we've got so much more um Yet we feel a stressed, a stressed or more stressed yeah. uh, than people used to feel 50 years ago. There must right. be something puzzling about this, and surely it must be to do with our objective of putting this huge emphasis on being super efficient, more and more productive. But for what? Right. Um, so I think that's a, a, a very important element in it. But I think another important element is that we actually now understand the causes of happiness much better uh, than before. Before, 
it was a matter of speculation. And of course, there was a lot of truth said, but also a lot of rubbish. Mm. <laughs> now we know uh, from the new science of happiness that's developed over right. the last 30 years, a, a huge amount um, a, a, about it. And that's the perhaps the rather important aspect of action happiness we haven't mentioned so far that is science-based. Uh, I think that makes a lot more credible uh, to people mm -hmm. and a lot more, you know, um, not just well-intentioned, but actually likely to be effective. Yeah, I think people's opinions and their perspective on what happiness is yeah. varies quite widely depending on who you ask. But with the science, there is actually, well, there are, there are your definitions, but they're actually now scientifically proven definitions. You know, by doing certain things, it can actually change the shape of your brain and as a result can create well-being, happiness, compassion. Yeah. And again, aspects that we found out more about the, on the eight-week course. Yeah, I mean, something simple like the gratitude, you know, writing down three things I found uh, just to... Right, mentioned yeah, the eight yeah. yeah you, you know, one wouldn't have realized that okay just and it really worked you know yeah. and it, it's, it's something so simple I, I wouldn't have thought of myself so I, I found that very beneficial actually that was one of the things that stood out for me and the great people that I met on the course well, as well but we're also told as we're growing up that in order to be happy you need to go to get a good education and then go to university and then get a good job mm -hmm. and then and then you know, it's been proven that, you know, you, you, can, you can become CEO and at that point you feel that you've been duped, as Alan Watts calls it, and you feel that, you know, you, you still may be as unhappy as you were before, that that will not be the reason for your happiness. And it's the same, you can use it as a, in, as a parallel to the economic growth that we've, you know, that the Western countries have enjoyed over the past 60, 70 years. But, but you mentioned the percentage level of happiness has increased perhaps a half or something, or almost negligible. Negligible, negligible, negligible in, right? And negligibly in the States where we've got the longest time series. Yeah. Uh, other country where it's also been absolutely flat is West Germany. Some countries have increased a little bit. Britain has increased a little bit. Mm -hmm. Some have decreased. Belgium. It's, a, it's a, a, a medley. But there's no, in absolutely no sense, does economic growth guarantee yeah. uh, more happiness. Mm -hmm. uh, and and therefore, you've got to be really ca careful uh, not to sacrifice important things in the name of economic growth. I mean, one terrible mistake, of course, which led to the financial crisis, was allowing the banks to persuade uh, the rest of the world mm -hmm. that they needed to do what they did for mm -hmm. the sake of economic growth, mm -hmm. although it created a huge risk mm -hmm. uh, of economic instability and mass unemployment, which then that impact. Uh, it was realised. So, uh, you know, there are, there, are, there are huge numbers of ways in which we as individuals too yeah. are te tend to find it difficult not to uh, put too much weight on money. It's very, very salient mm -hmm. um, and sacrifice our family life or some other uh, thing which is really uh, at the margin more valuable for yes. the sake of more money. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's quite a siren <laughs> right. uh, uh, the, the, the money thing but I think what I find really inspiring um, is the kind of way of reorienting your mind you were talking about it so that I mean on the one side uh, you're more resilient against things that go wrong because you learn how to step aside from your th from your own thoughts exactly sure um, Mindfulness is one way in which you can learn that. Um, but the other is, of course, to focus on the positive because we are genetically mm. constructed, <laughs> you know, so as to be looking around the, yeah, <laughs> uh, back to the, the amygdala line, fight to the nearest flight, line. Right. Yeah. Sure. Um, but he isn't there. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, life, the, the, the objective threats yeah. are, are much lower than most people mm -hmm. feel. So people get into this frame of mind where they feel that actually they're under threat. Mm -hmm. um, when in some sense they might be under threat. I mean, it might be that somebody else is going to uh, be promoted over them. So if, if, if that's critical to them, they are under threat. But yeah. on the other hand, if, if they had a, a better sense of values about you know, what are the good objectives in life, mm -hmm. yeah. um, you don't need to feel uh, under threat to that mm -hmm. extent. And 
Uh, I think this book by Mathieu Ricard, this, who is this amazing monk, uh, I think, did you interview Mathieu? I did interview Mathieu. Yeah. I mean, his book on altruism, I think, is the most important book of this decade. Yeah. And it stresses this concept of unconditional benevolence, that this is the frame of mind that one has to get into. Mm. And I must say, I've, I personally found this very helpful, that if you feel a threat, uh, just say to yourself, no, I mean, what, what I'm here for is to be giving out, not to <laughs> be, pu be pushing back, but to, but to be giving out. And uh, you, can, you can sideline many of these sources of anxiety which we all experience if you focus on what you yourself can positively contribute to, uh, to the world. And often I think when, 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 when you look back at times when you were stressed for, let's say, promotion or whatever it could be, it's actually often unnecessary when you look back from a sort of, uh, sort of in hindsight, you know, from, from a standpoint, say, years down the line, and you, and you look back at the times in your lives where you, where you were really unhappy for something, and you realize, actually, it wasn't that important, it was actually more me. I think it's quite empowering to realize that it's just a shift in your... Yes, well, uh, Daniel Kahneman always says, nothing is as important uh, as it appears to be at the time you're thinking about it. And yeah. I think that's quite an important bit of wisdom. Yeah. yeah. Well, being stressed and feeling anxiety, that actually has some real negative effects in the long run. Um, and it's something that you speak about a lot, about the, the mental health issues that can result. Yeah. You know, just by constantly being stressed and by, and there's not a, there hasn't been enough emphasis on that. And there are many people that are feeling physical negative repercuss repercussions, you know, because yeah, they yeah. are constantly in a state of stress or not being, they don't have the simple tools in which they can use to, to help alleviate that. Yes, well, I think there's been a ter terrible neglect of mental health problems in, in our society, um, which is partly because of sh people feel ashamed of it, uh, and their relatives feel ashamed, and unfortunately Freud made the relatives feel even more ashamed than they probably felt before, yeah. um, because they thought it was all their fault. Um, so that's one reason why it's been pushed under the carpet. But the other is that until recently, um, we haven't really had uh, tools to deal uh, with the problem um, very effectively. Um, so we've had antidepressants for about 50 years, 60 years, um, which have some value for severe depression, but they're not a general answer mm -hmm. to most forms of mental illness. Uh, and really, the, 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 much the most important thing which has happened has been the revolution in psychological therapy. Um, uh, over the last, uh, say, 40 years, um, especially the development of cognitive behavioral therapy, but also others, interpersonal therapy and brief psychotherapy as well. Yeah. Um, well, we, we know because it's been put on a scientific basis so that we can measure the outcome. Um, and we know from that that uh, you know, a substantial proportion, certainly more than half of the people who are given these uh, uh, therapies with quite a limited number of sessions, we're not talking about more than 16 sessions normally, mm -hmm. you'll have more than half of the people completely uh, recovering from their symptoms of depression or, yeah. or, or really quite serious anxiety disorders like not being able to go out of the house. Yeah. Um, so you've got people who, who particularly with anxiety disorders, um, who, who've been really sick for uh, 10 or 20 years, um, whose lives can be completely turned around. Right. Um, in this way, and it's really scandalous <laughs> that yeah. these therapies have not are not yet in any country available on a routine basis to everybody. Yeah. Um, but it, it seemed to me that this was the most obvious thing that one could do uh, to lift the, uh, the amount of misery in, in, in a Western society. Yeah. Uh, and fortunately, the British NHS has made major steps through improving access to psychological therapies yeah. to get these therapies more widely available and uh, it's going to uh, improve still over the next next five years. So I think this is important and we, we uh, I mentioned it because actually uh, 
we like to think that this is a an example uh, that can be followed worldwide mm. of how to get evidence-based psychological therapy available um, to the millions of people who need it. We're talking about six million people in Britain mm -hmm. suffering from depression or anxiety disorders. It's huge number. Yeah. Diagnosable. Yeah. Um, of whom uh, not more than a third are, are currently in treatment, um, yeah. Yeah. which is is shows something about the, the false priorities. Yeah. That uh, you know, uh, unless you can touch it or see it, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's not it, it's not really there. Yeah. Um, and we've got to become. This is part of the whole um, transformation, where we get more value to people's feelings, to their, their inner life. Mm. Um, and we accept that people's feelings are every scrap as objective yeah. <laughs> uh, as, um, you know, their exam performance. Mm. Mm -hmm. yes. um, and it's, it's quite horrifying the way people use the word, well, something is only subjective. Mm. Of course, the feeling is in some sense subjective because it's a feeling. Right. But it has an objective reality. And what actually got me into this subject was discovering that the neuroscientists have found ways uh, of uh, locating the areas of the brain in which the, the level of activity corresponds to what people feel. Yes. And, yeah. and, and so that gives you a, a sort of clear argument that what people feel is objective because yes. those it electrical measurements of the brain yeah. are objective yeah. Yeah. and therefore the thing which they're measuring. Yes. Yeah, is is objective. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're talking about a, a profound cultural transformation where what we think is actually matters is what people feel, mm. and not you know ul ul the ultimate value is not the the external performance or yes. whatever else how how people yeah. feel. Um, and that's what we should be giving more attention to. Uh, we should give more attention to it. Um, at the workplace, we should give more attention to it, obviously, in families, yeah. um, more attention to it in schools. Mm. I think a, an extraordinary thing, actually, in relations between couples is how, how they, they will destroy, in many cases, their own peace of mind mm. by arguing over something where it really doesn't matter that much mm -hmm. which way or the other, as compared with whether they feel yeah. in harmony with each other. So we need to value explicitly value mm. harmony. We know harmony is what matters. Well, harmony is what matters yes. to people. Yes. <laughs> but in the way people behave, yeah. Yeah. they don't behave as if harmony is, is a supreme value. Yeah. So we, we have to have, uh, have that. It's quite interesting that I think, and this, this is, is coming up more in the language of Eastern governments mm -hmm. and Western governments yet, the importance of harmony. Okay. Uh, uh, I think it's a good word. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> harmony. But you, it, was, it was a great uh, Shakespeare. You'll find a lot about harmony in the, in the musical analogy. Um, it's a, it's a, it's quite a good one. Yeah, and you also made the case for um, the fact that if if we invest more in mental health, it will pay for itself. Um, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the shocking thing is that whereas it's felt in most health services. If a person's got a physical illness uh, and there's an evidence-based treatment which can uh, help it, yeah. they automatically get it. So most people with diabetes and treatment, most people with angina, you name it. Depression is a more debilitating a disease. This has been shown in many studies than angina, uh, than asthma, than uh, um, arthritis. Uh, than diabetes, yeah. and yet uh, less than a third of people with depression are mm. in treatment. I mean, this is deeply, deeply, deeply shocking. Mm -hmm. And um, you would think that it should be dealt with purely on humanitarian grounds. Yeah. And in fact, to get people to take it seriously, <laughs> we've had to make this argument, yeah. which is a true argument, yeah. Yeah. that because um, it, it's such a a damper on a person's ability to work. Yeah. Um, if you treat people with depression or indeed with anxiety disorders, um, across the board, yeah. a lot of them will be working, but there are enough of them will not be working who become able to work for the whole program to pay for itself. And that was uh, the argument which, uh, 
clinched it when we got this program going back in originally in 2007, Seven. and we still have to roll it out now. Mm. In fact, there was a, there was an absolutely bizarre, amazing statement in the coalition agreement mm -hmm. um, that we will uh, expand psychological therapy in order to save NHS costs. Mm -hmm. Who would say we will expand uh, heart surgery in order to ch save an agent? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a yeah. completely extraordinary phrase, but th that shows yeah. it's an illustration of why we need action for happiness. Yes. We're up against an, a deeply materialistic yes. culture, Everything which includes matters. that heart yeah. matters more than mind. Mm. Mind. Mm. <clears throat> and even in, there are cases that if you suffer depression in your teen years, you're more likely to suffer depression at a later age. Yes. And the relationship between, or as a young, being young, being taught about the, the relationship with your thoughts and by treating other people well, and by, I guess, having fun. And you mentioned that was a, a better factor or an indicator of the health and the, the satisfaction of life later on than their academic grades. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, if you, if we're talking now about what we can do for children, so as to, of course, make them enjoy their life while they're children, which sure. is very important, but also to build in the capacity to become happy adults. Um, we were able to look from one of these so-called cohort studies where children all born in 1970 have been followed through uh, their lives into adulthood. Mm. If you ask how, if we look at the child, can we best predict whether they will become right. happy adults? There are, I suppose, th th three main uh, sort of dimensions of child development. One is intellectual test scores and all of that, um, exam results. The traditional way, right? T well, the second, which people have always had some interest in, is how they behave, can they behave properly. Mm. But the third is What's their emotional health? How do they feel inside? Yeah. And um, it won't surprise you <laughs> to know that the worst predictor of whether you'll be a... Uh, it's a really important point. Whether you will be an adult who is satisfied with and enjoying their lives, the worst predictor of that is academic, academic performance. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and the best predictor is the emotional health of the person when they were a child. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the, the implications of, of maybe parents thinking twice about how they because you know unfortunately we do live in a world where not all parents treat their children you know um or have raised their children in in in, in a happy environment whether it be alcohol abuse at home or, or things like that and i think it's important that people realize that you know long after childhood the the, the impact it could have in your adult life and so to think yeah, twice yeah. about your actions you know towards children um, that you know, there's the consequences. Well, there are things which are sort of under parents' control to some extent, like whether they quarrel with each other. Yeah. Um, we know this has a very bad effect on a person's subsequent well, child's subsequent well-being. Yeah. Um, but there are also things which may they may not be able to deal with on their own, which is like, for example, uh, women who become depressed after childbirth. Yeah. I mean, this is a worldwide phenomenon. Yeah. They need. Uh, rapid uh, treatment and treatment can be very effective yes, for that yes. condition but somebody needs to notice it like the health visitor yeah. and somebody needs to be available to provide the therapy yeah. uh, so yeah. that's a, a big challenge now mm. uh, for this psychological therapy service um, that I've been talking about but I think also of course children uh, uh, need to be brought up in a loving way but in the relationship between the parent and the child uh, and uh, I'm sure we could do a better job of teaching parents, particularly in, par in parenting classes at the time when the child was born, yeah. about that aspect of child rearing yes. uh, as well as changing the nappies. Yeah. Um, uh, and this has got to become universal, I think. The, mm. Not compulsory, but the, the both it should be the norm that both parents go along to parenting classes, yeah. certainly at the time of the birth of the first child, yeah. um, in, in order to to understand, uh, you know, the importance yes. of that, but not also how 
how to be how to do it better, how to get along with each other better, quite frankly. Because yeah. when the child arrives, a lot of relationships start collapsing yeah. when the child arrives. So there's, there's so much that people could usefully learn at that point. And then, of course, we have to have I interventions, as you were saying, to help children who have become depressed in adolescence, a lot of depression in adolescence, uh, and unfortunately has increased in the last 40 years. Um, a, a lot of anxiety starting actually even before adolescence. Yeah. Um, easy to identify, and of course behavioural problems that will continue into later life. Um, uh, antisocial behaviour, serious antisocial behaviour in adult life is usually um, being identified by the time the child is 10. Wow. In the, uh, at least fifty percent of the mm -hmm. of the times, mm -hmm. um, and sh and should have, that child should have been receiving help, and the parents should have been receiving help in, in how to um, how to help the child to uh, become um, a, a civilized and charming <laughs> child. Yeah. Um, so, you know, child mental health is a central issue, and it's been quite shocking to see how that's been actually cut back in the last five years mm -hmm. in in Britain. It's uh, deeply shocking. Yeah. Right. How are you for time? I'm fine. Let's yeah. go on to school. We need to go on to schools at least. Yeah. 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 So um, as, as, as a school teacher myself, um, I've realised, and I know uh, Anthony Seldon has mentioned this, that our schools should be more than just exam factories. Um, so I just wanted your, your views on how we could use this movement to maybe help our teachers uh, become more aware of the importance of happiness and well-being for, for students yes, to succeed. Yes, well, I think four things. I mean, I think that, you know, the, 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 the well-being of the children has got to be an explicit goal of the school as well as just the exam results. Yeah. Um, uh, and to make that happen, uh, because the exam results can be measured, uh, you've got to measure the well-being as well. Yeah. Uh, so we've got uh, we have to do it sensitively. But we've got to get to the situation where uh, schools are routinely me measuring the well-being of their children, and that uh, becomes something that you know Ofsted or anybody else can look at. Yeah. Uh, if, you, know, you know their well-being when they enter, let's say five into the primary school. You know their well-being when they leave. Yeah. <laughs> How was the school? Was the school doing? Very, yeah. Uh, on that on that dimension, yeah. uh, but then how would it achieve a good result? Have to have a very good ethos, obviously, um, of respect and so on between all the parties in the school, which includes teachers between each other <laughs> and between the uh, the teachers and the parents and the children, also between obviously the, the children and each other and mm -hmm. parents and so on. But uh, I think. You know, a sort of written code that everybody signs to. Yeah. It's, it's quite a good idea. Um, like the pledge, the action for happiness pledge. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and then um, there's the quite specific teaching of life skills, and I, I believe this can be done in an evidence-based way. There have been lots and lots of programs, small little programs, uh, which have been shown to have results, at least in the short run, um, which are really worth having given the very small cost involved in running these programs. And I'm talking about programs not only on social and emotional understanding of yourself and others, um, but SRE, sex and relationships, healthy living. But also we, we, we would add in uh, parenting, uh, media awareness so that you don't feel you've got to run with the herd all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, mindfulness as a, a practice uh, that, that can get everything into a better perspective. So, so we, we've, been, we've put together actually, this is not totally an action for happiness project, but uh, we've put together um, a, a course for children um, in secondary schools that could form a basis of a sort of one, one hour a week right through secondary education, which I think has great potential. Mm. But since we're now talking about courses, <laughs> we must come back to where you started, 
right. uh, they're, they're exploring what matters, of course. Yes. Because, and let's, let's come back to ac action for happiness and our aspirations for action for happiness. Yeah. I think we need a complete cultural change in the West. Um, we, we have a sort of uh, ethical void which has been left by the, the retreat of religious belief. Uh, and this will become increasingly uh, obvious that um, th there's, 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 there's no obvious framework in which people continue to strengthen their ethical beliefs and their, 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 their own practice yeah. through some sort of um, organizational framework where they repeatedly meet with people who share their views and aspirations yeah. uh, in trying to lead a good life. So, our hope is that Action for Happiness will become um, a movement um, that has some some of some of the features features of of the churches in the sense yeah. that people meet regularly around yeah. really important things to inspire yeah. to be inspired and to inspire each other to support each other. Well, I can I can actually just if I can jump in and say that that void I felt that void actually you know not being religious myself and I think right. it has done a great job you know to fill that because we meet up at the events and you know we have the discussions and and right. the inspirational talks so just from a personal perspective I think it's um, deeply helped me um, fill that void because not going to church not going to temples or right yeah great well that's wonderful to hear and of course what we're hoping is that these groups could could you need something to get a group off the ground. Yes. The, this course can be a way of getting a group off the so ground. But we would hope that then it would have a life of its own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, that, um, you know, there would be a sort of fairly standard format that um, people would be following because it's been tested and found sure. to work. Yeah. Not, not, not necessarily so long. It's a course. It's two hours at a time, isn't it? Yeah. I think uh, people don't can't you unless we spend that long so like more like an hour at a time perhaps. Yeah. um which would um where people would meet regularly yeah. you know throughout life this, yeah. this would be your the, the thing going. the thing you did to sustain yourself yeah okay um in october this year and it, and we hope it could become a worldwide movement right well the the crowdfunding event that um that, that you guys totally smashed. There was uh, a goal of about forty thousand pounds, and it was over into the hundreds, yeah, uh, yeah, just because of the phenomenal support. There's so many people, I think, that are just searching for something that they want to feel a part of, you know. And this, yeah. this, this is a community that, you know, is kind of what drew us in. It's like when we meet at these events. Mark Williamson mentioned that this is where the magic happens in in, in the small groups where you yeah, meet up exactly, and you're able exactly, to share yeah. stories. And people actually share, share their experience. <clears throat> And become really open with each other about issues that really matter to them. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the big events that took place this year was the uh, the Dalai Lama. Yes. Event. Um, you know, which was, I mean, of all the people we could ever imagine to as a guest to come and represent, because he's a patron for the Action for Happiness. Can you explain? He's the first member. Is that right? The first member. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, could you explain perhaps your your friendship with him and how he came to? Well, be part of the... um, it comes through the scientific connections that I mentioned, because he um, is actually very interested in science. Um, when he was a little boy, apparently he insisted on taking the Rolls Royce. The, the, the official, his official Rolls Royce to be <laughs> see how it works. Um, so he's really interested in Western science, in, including uh, obviously neuroscience, because that that must be uh, in some sense consistent with your philosophy, your psychological, uh, your beliefs about human psychology. And so he's been very interested in whether Buddhist psychology is in tune with. Western neuroscience, which it seems that uh, in very many ways it is. Um, so there's this group of people uh, bound together by an organization called Mind and Life that meet with the Dalai Lama uh, uh, regularly uh, uh, and usually produce a book each time. And there was one of these meetings was held in Zurich um, in 2000 and I think uh, 10 probably. Uh, and um, 
there are different people sort of make presentations to the Dalai Lama about aspects of the science. And this was the first time they had some economists, economic scientists, uh, presenting to the Dalai Lama, which I did. And then I mentioned our hopes for acts of happiness. And I was about to ask him to join, and his hand was already in the air. Wow. <laughs> so, so he was our first member, as you say. And then um, there was, I went to another of these meetings and was on the stage with him uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. And um, we were discussing secular ethics. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was going, going well, and he asked me to go and have lunch with him to continue it. And I thought, oh, well, why don't uh, we get him to become patron, say? Beautiful. Uh, he, he did. And, uh, you know, he's been an inspiration, obviously, to all of us. Yeah. yeah. And on the day, there was Matthew Ricard speaking, Richard Davidson, Daniel Goldman, yeah. the really yeah. great pioneers, you know, collaborating to, yeah. to bring the science together with the philosophy. It's yeah. yeah. Uh, do you meditate regularly? And <laughs> sort of in the tube. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's quite, it's quite a good. It's, um, it's rather nice to be able to escape from the tube into, into right. a meditative state. Mm -hmm. But you have to make sure you get out at the right stop after that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So to find out more, visit actionforhappiness.org. You can find the links to the Exploring What Matters course there, the unique and, eight, the unique and inspiring eight week course. Um, you can also find out about upcoming events. We regularly have guest speakers that come, um, um, which we, we've been part of for the, for the last year. Um, also find us on Twitter at Action Happiness uh, and the same thing on Facebook. Uh, Richard, it's truly been an honor. Thank you very much for doing this and hopefully we can, um, we can do one again soon. Yes, of course. And it's been lovely talking to you. <laughs> and, uh, good luck. Um, in spreading the word. Uh, I think you're a very important uh, part of this story, what you're doing. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Cheers. Great. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Yeah.